uh, in our forecast portfolio, um, when we exit the contract, and then there's a whole bunch of steps between now and then, um, if and when, it depends upon what uh, the Palmer owners do with the applications, et cetera. Um, but one of the things that we have been working on over the past uh, several months is what I'll call basically an exit ramp for the RMLD to exit. Um, there are some, so we are positioned to do that. But right now we are uh, waiting what will continue to happen relative to uh, Palmer owners and uh, managers of that facility in terms of what they're going to do next. So we are poised, um, but we haven't taken any additional action or any final action until that's, uh, that's finalized. But we're, and the other thing that you'll see in a few moments, um, both last month and this month, we are um, backfilling and preparing to backfill um, uh, that power. Obviously we need to continue to fill our portfolio. So you'll see some additional um, request for uh, additional um, opportunities in this particular case in the hydro safe stuff. So those are those are two pieces of the answer to that question. Does that help? Do you know Do you know when that? I mean, you, you mentioned that, of course, the the the, the March what twenty twenty three data is. Do you, Do you have any idea when you make when you are going to pull the trigger on this thing and 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 exit? I'm so it 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 um. So it depends heavily on what the Palmer entity does, because depending upon what they do, it will impact how we execute our plan. And so, um, not knowing what they're doing exactly, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would be speculation at the most. But sometime between now, there's a key milestone in March of 2022. Um, hopefully, things will be resolved well before then. Um, and then there's a potential another milestone in March of 2023. Mm -hmm. But the plant doesn't exist at this point in time, so um, this is an economic discussion at this point in time. Does that help? It does. It does. I'm just, I just I would encourage you to be as aggressive on this point as, as you can. Thank we, you. It, it, it'll become Thank clear you, that we're ready. Yeah. And and uh, and we have been. I may not seem that way to many people who've been following us, but we have been trying to be very aggressive and exploring all all alternatives for doing this. Um, I might just mention that the last thing in the world we want to do is breach an existing contract uh, because that has major implications for everybody, not just Reading, but everybody uh, here. And so we are being very careful about that and staying within all the legal guidelines. And I think uh, from what you've seen and from what we've all seen, um, the, um, the potential is such that the plant will probably not be able to meet its contractual obligations from at least from what we've seen and heard as well as what you've seen and heard. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Gail. Thank you, John. Um, so I, uh, I also asked a question in the cab and uh, both Greg and, and Colleen did a great job answering it, but I did have one um, concern about the answer. And uh, the point I was making um, was that in the customer survey, it was clear that customers um, are willing, a, a majority of your customers are willing to pay for a rate increase to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, yet in the green, clean energy policy, it says that um, customers want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but without, but with little or no price increase. Colleen explained, I, I, and I was very helpful about how in the mission statement it talks about um, keeping low costs, and, and I, I get that. And um, she mentioned that, you know, there might be some changes because given the climate crisis and, and that, thank goodness, the mood in the country is becoming more um, proactive, um, yeah. we, you might be changing that policy, which is great. Um, but I would just request that uh, the clean energy policy be um, amended so that it isn't misstating where the source of keeping the prices low is it's not coming from the customers because the majority are asking for more um, or we are willing to pay more it's really coming from your mission statement so I'd be more comfortable if the wording was changed to say that you know we will however follow um, you know the, our mission statement at this mo point which is to keep prices as low as possible or it doesn't say as low as possible but it says to be low that's just what I would put out there as my request because I'm uncomfortable with having a statement that does not accurately reflect what the customer said in the customer survey. That's all. Thank you for that input. Do we, uh, any other comments from 
commissioners relative to this? Uh, Bob, you have your hand. Oh, your hand raised, Bob. Yeah, um, thank you, John. Um, you know, I, I I understand exactly what you're saying, but um, I think our mission statement, uh, you know, rates, reliability, and revenue, you know, are extremely important um, to to everybody. I, I know. Um, yes, there is a subset of customers willing willing to pay more, but. Uh, you know, we can talk about numbers all day long. I, I, I'd be hesitant to say majority are willing to pay more. So thank you. Yeah, I think this survey showed uh, is that there were different categories of how much people were willing to pay. And we're going to try to implement something that reflects that, that allows people to, uh, to pay uh, in, in different categories. We haven't really formally talked about how to accomplish that yet. I think it's a really good idea. Um, and so without turning it into an administrative nightmare from a IT perspective, you know, we, I'm, certainly we'd want to do that. I mean, the, the survey said 67%, I have it here in front of me, would like RMLD to be aggressive with respect to setting goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And I think we're on that path. I think we're really trying to react faster and go further than we're, what we're being mandated to do by the state. So we have that in mind. Uh, we've... You know, we ran the survey, uh, we heard the respondents, and so we have a couple different uh, uh, goals to meet here, and we just have to kind of balance those out, but we understand where you're coming from, Gail. Well, uh, if there are no more other questions from the public, uh, thank you very much, um, and we'll move on with the meeting. Um, if you don't, here we go. Yeah, thank you. I would like if there. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Uh, report on the Citizens Advisory Board meeting. Um, Mr. Pacino. Mr. Chairman, let me, let me start by making a comment here first on the public and the public. Uh, I'm going to request that the um, we review how we allow the ratepayers to speak at these meetings. Um, I, you know, I'm now starting my 35th year. Feels like I got here yesterday, to be honest with you. But, you know, I've always run with the idea of transparency and listening to the ratepayers. And I'm a little bit uneasy with the policy that we have in place for the way we're allowing the ratepayers to give us input. I just came from the Citizen Advisory Board meeting where we had citizens in the middle of the meeting ask questions and brought up their, their ideas. And they were, very, you know, as long as you're respectful, you know, that's the one thing I will, I will ask everybody to be respectful. I really do feel that we need to review how we're allowing the ratepayer input uh, going forward and coming started with the next meeting. Uh, it's, it's a quest that I'm going to make that we need that we need to review that because I'm uncomfortable with the process we have now. We're just letting people in at the minute for 10 minutes. Um, you know, I, we've never done that in the past in my 35 years. I've, I've gone through 12 elections. The one thing that I've stated in every single election, my first thing is transparency and listening to the ratepayers. And I, I'm gonna reemphasize that today completely that we should be doing that. We should be allowing these people in during the meeting if they, they raise their hand and they have a question, as long as they're respectful. That's uh, again, I request that. We, they should be allowed to speak. I have my, I have my piece said. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. And um, I just want to make a comment back to you on that on that topic. In general, I completely agree with you. Uh, when you get, unfortunately, when you get 20 to 30 people in a room and you in a Zoom meeting, I mean, this works much, much better when we're all together in a room together. We can see people. When you have 30 people on board and our little boxes are that much smaller, it's very difficult to tell who's talking, who's raising their hand. And when people are making comments, out of order, it's not a good thing. And so that was one of the reasons that I instituted it or suggested we do anyway, in the last couple of meetings. And the second is that the select board uses this exact process for that I don't exact know what reason. The select board does, that's their business, you know? I, we should be setting our own rules, not, not following somebody else's rules. Phil, that's absolutely fine. And you know, even the constitution has how many amendments? 29 now? So even the constitution was changed in 35 years. So. So it's, we're always looking for best practices and we can always discuss this and you know we can address this certainly in future meetings. 
Okay, but I'm going to ask the leadership for the next meeting to review this item and decide what they want to do. That's just fine. Absolutely. Um, let's see. I'd uh, like advisor. to. Oh, I'm Phil. Sorry, Phil. But did you have finished the um, the re response from the advisory in the cab meeting? Yeah. So basically, uh, I don't want to steal any Greg's thunder tonight. So I won't steal any Greg's thunder coming up. Later <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, um, did make an outstanding presentation on, on his area. So I look forward to that. Uh, beyond that, we heard reports from uh, Hamid. So I won't steal Hamid's uh, thunder either on, on all the awards that he's won. And uh, Wendy actually gave an outstanding presentation on the billing, on the uh, receivable process, on the uh, invoice process that she'll, I hope she'll be giving that again tonight. So, and that kind of sums it up. Again, I don't want to steal anybody's thunder. Great, thank you very much, Phil. Okay. I'd like to move on to item number four, approval of the board minutes. And before we do that, I'd like to thank Mr. Pacino uh, for going through perhaps one of the longest minutes I think we've ever had, certainly in the time that I've been here, yeah. and looking over the, and reviewing the board minutes. It went on page after page after page, especially in tax season. Uh, so um, yeoman duty, Mr. Pacino, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. I, I basically, the commissioners I, and the guests, I tried to cut, you know, take as little bit out of what they had to say as I could. It was more just grammar in terms of and what, in terms of what they were saying. And then obviously there were some errors that, you know, the, the left-hand margin didn't quite work right at times. <laughs> <laughs> okay. With that, could you uh, read the suggested motion? Yes, I will. Um, let's see, move that the Board of Commissioners approve the meeting minutes of January 20th, 2021, meeting on the recommendation of general manager. I have a second, please. Thank you, Mr. Coulter. Um, a roll call vote, Mr. Stempeck, aye. Ms. Bacino, aye. Mr. Talbot, aye. Mr. Coulter, aye. Excellent. Marlena, uh, could you raise your hand? Yep, I <laughs> thank you very much. Marina okay. actually should probably abstain because she was not at the meeting, to be honest. Oh, that's a good point. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I abstain. Recommended she abstain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, very good. <laughs> but I'm sure they look good, right, Marlena? <laughs> really good. John, you should yes. just Mr. Colter. Help Marlena with the little <laughs> like the protocol. Like do the roll call vote. <laughs> yes, we'll 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 get on to that or someone else may. Uh, what I'd like to do at this point in the meeting is if no one has an objection, I'd like to move item number 14, which is the election of the new chair and vice chair forward. Um, and I'd like to make one change to the suggested motion. But first, uh, does anyone have an objection for me moving it forward to this point? No, that's fine. I'm sorry, Dave? That's fine, no. Okay. no fine with me. Yeah. Good, um, I'd like to change the suggested motion. I'd like to... Um, uh, also suggest uh, how we would proceed through the, the, the nomination. Uh, what I'd like to do is once the, the floor is open for nomination, I'll write down the nomination of whoever would, would like to be nominated. And then I'll take a poll alphabetically of all of the commissioners, uh, starting with Marlena, going to Bob, et cetera, you know, alphabetically by last name. And then of course, whoever uh, gets the majority vote uh, wins and becomes the new commissioner. And I'd like to modify the, uh, the chair, I mean, I'd like to modify the, uh, the motion to be effective immediately, not at the end of the meeting, so that the new chair would be able to proceed with this particular meeting. If there's, is there any objection to that? No. If not, uh, could I open the floor for nominations for the chair? Um, I'd like to nominate uh, Bob Coulter. Are there any other nominations? I, I can second that nomination. Um, and, and just to, if I may, Mr. Chair. Yes, please. Uh, I think, you know, we've had, we've had a, a, basically a rotation in the past, and I think that's a sensible thing to do. And it's sort of, you know, it's Bob and, and Phil are kind of uh, due and, and overdue. Um, the only tweak I would say, and it would apply to me as well, is that when we're heading into an election year, it may be good practice to think about not having the chair be um, seated at the election in case 
you know, that that's a practice in other in other areas. So that would just influence how I would look at it, whether it was for me or anybody else. Um, so that's all. So if that, we, yeah, that, that's that's a good good idea. As a matter of fact, the select board had uh, Bob uh, sort of run the process. Yeah, and, and that's fine. I'm not sure who would do it here. Maybe Colleen. Um, what, do you, what do you mean, run the process? Well, in terms of you know doing the polling, I'm assuming that's what you were you were talking about. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm just saying in general, we might think about that as being a board policy that. You know, so like in this case, it could be Bob, uh, Bob Coulter as chair and Phil as vice chair, for example. That's how this could work out. Um, that's all I'm saying. Um, oh, okay. And then, you know, you were, you're it now. I was it last year. So it's kind of like, you know, my latest news. So it kind of makes sense, right? So yeah, how I see it going, but. Um, okay, I have, I've got no, no issue yeah. with that. And as a matter of fact, we probably should incorporate that into our, uh, our, our process, our portfolio uh, for, uh, for these so so that it just happens and we can actually call it out yeah and i don't know if i didn't mean to step on whatever the process you no, have it's okay it's a good idea nominating or polling or whatever but anyway well we have one nomination for bob coulter and uh if you could answer yes or no when i call your name i would appreciate it uh marlena yes uh bob yes phil yes i say yes Mr. Yeah, Talbot? I think I, I think I already said yes to Bob. Yeah, so. Okay, so congratulations. We have a, a new chair and you have the pleasant duty now of uh, running the vice chair nomination. <clears throat> Thank you. I, um, I'd like to nominate Phil for the vice chair. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other nominations for vice chair? If not, uh, Marlena? Yes. Bob? Yes. Phil? Yes, obviously. <laughs> well, it's not always <laughs> You could decline. I mean, you've done it 35 times. I've always voted for myself. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've ever voted against I say yes. <laughs> Absolutely no way. I can't tolerate this. No, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. OK, so we have a new chair, a new uh, vice chair. Thank you very much. I'm out of the hot seat now for the time being. And um, Bob, would you please carry on with our next item? I'll try to help along and just Phil will help along in terms of- right, I'm gonna get my glasses because- uh, I, 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 One item, Bob, Bob, can I just have one item? I will continue as the secretary, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, we're on to item number five, the man general manager's report. Uh, so please feel free to conduct okay. it. Uh, Colleen, could you please um, present the general manager's report? Yes. Thank you, and good evening. Um, I'm going to give some updates uh, before we get into the policies. Uh, we're going to be having a virtual EV workshop on April 27th. So you don't have to memorize any of these. I'll have Joyce send them out, but April 27th at 7 o'clock. Um, I'm pleased to say we've already got 124 registrations. Uh, that was uh, as of April 20th. And some of the community TV stations will be broadcasting this live. So we'll send that out. Um, we were thinking of having in the same week, the high school awards thing. So I sent out all of the artwork from the high school and thank you for everyone for voting and everyone from staff voted. And we have some winners. We give first place uh, gets a hundred dollars and they're on the cover of our annual report. I think you probably remember before I got here it was very fancy annual report and now we're doing high school we keep the cost down and and the artwork as you saw is spectacular uh, along with their narratives so hundred dollars for first prize then 75 then 50 and then 25 and they spend that on art supplies uh, and school supplies um, we were thinking of the 29th but phil said that that was um a town meeting one of the town meeting nights so i t i texted joyce i think we're going to set it for the first week of may what I'm looking for is at least one commissioner to show up and maybe one cab member. I think that always makes the kids feel really good. Um, and we'll, we'll ask them to read their narratives, you know, very similar to how we've been doing the third grade um, uh, electric education and, and poster contest. So I'll, we'll pick a date and send that out. Um, Wendy's gonna talk a little bit later. We're thinking that the audit committee, uh, we might be ready to schedule that in May, which means that the annual report will come out in June, but I'll let her talk about that. 
Um, we're looking at uh, possibly a battery walkthrough with some of our state delegates uh, at our five megawatt battery facility. As you recall, we got a million dollar ACES grant. And the concept would be to talk to them about more potential battery grants in the future uh, for smart grids and things like that. So we're looking forward to that coming up. Um, the virtual electrification presentation is scheduled for June 7th. That's at 2.30. This is event is in partnership with the Wilmington Public Library to coincide with their Earth Year uh, theme. Um, the, let's see, the RMLD, as you know, has applied for uh, EV grants from the state. We put in level three chargers as well as level two. The towns of Wilmington and Reading are both submitted. We're keeping our fingers crossed. We don't have any status back yet on those grant awards, but as soon as we hear, we will let you know uh, how we made out. Um, we're having a bike, as you know, we've had a bike event that is usually done by Reading Cares, but because our policy on facilities said you know that we changed it says okay they have to have a liability waiver with a town board and committee which means that any of the four towns that we service can all use some of the properties and the bike event was sponsored by Reading Cares and because of the liability it's now sponsored by the Reading Climate Action Committee with Reading Cares and we were able to secure command incident approval and a COVID plan in order to let that go through this year. So we're really excited about that. That's April 30th is the drop off. May 1st is the um, the actual when the kids come in and they get to pick the bikes out. There's going to be you know masks and six foot, six foot distancing, all COVID plans uh, authorized by Board of Health. And then it's also meeting our emergency operating procedures on infectious disease. So um, there's flyers going out. We're helping them with some area abutters notices. So I th we think that that'll be a great springboard for some more small baby step events uh, going forward as we, as we all try to um, you know come out of uh, of the COVID uh, time period. Um, we do have uh, the YMCA in Reading is sponsoring a health day for the kids. So naturally we're gonna go down and teach electrical safety and education to them. And that's supposed to be on May 11th. Um, only one more issue that I wanted to talk about. And that is, you know, every year we have to look at all of the rebates and programs that we do. Because if you remember when we first gave out rebates for window air conditioning and every year we'd say, okay, in order for that to be a benefit to both the RMLD and to the customers, we would increase the SEER rating. And then we went from windows to whole house, house air conditioning. And we continue to do that every year. What is the best way to spend the customer money in order to give a benefit back to the RMLD and the customers? So we're gonna we're in the process of doing that. We may have some rebate changes, additions, and that will come as part of the class cost of service study that we're running right now that Greg and Chuck will be presenting probably next month and see how that how that fans out and, and we'll give you the update on that. So that's all I've got for right now. Um, if, if there's any questions, thank you. Thank you, Colleen. All right. Um, do we want to go into the review of policies? Again, right. Dr. Colleen. Okay. Um, and I apologize, Malena, I didn't put a copy of our policy review schedule. We, you know, <clears throat> I, we, we changed it a while ago that they didn't have review dates. So now we have about a three year review date and we go through them and we scrub them for law and other things. Um, and so I can give you that table, but this, uh, this month, um, and we spent a lot of time on policy 30, which was a really important, but we got a little bit behind on our policies. Um, so there's a couple, a couple few of them that ha there's recommending no changes and that's on the safety review we run a pretty tight safety uh, review team. Uh, two, we have two committees, both the electrical and the general, and we meet all of this criteria. So I'm not recommending any changes and there's nothing in the industry that would warrant any legal changes or anything with uh, best utility practices. So that is policy three. Do you wanna get a vote on each one or at the end or how do you wanna do this uh, chair? Do you, you wanna just, you want me to go through each one of them and then we can um, go, vote through them? I, I, I would say very quickly, if you could go through them, Colleen, okay, great. just, right. just so you're familiar. Okay, uh, policy six is our drug and alcohol free workplace. And as you know, I, I've been working really hard over the last six years to get everyone in all of our union contracts <laughs> on drug and alcohol free. 
Uh, we have a lot of CDL testing uh, and a lot of the drug and alcohol has also been is put into their collective bargaining agreement. So I'm not uh, suggesting any uh, updates on that. So we'll just have another review date for of three years. Um, the next one is the facility use. Now I have a very minor comment on that. Um, technically it's not incorrect, but we we've, we've been asked to clarify it. The intent of the use was to allow things that did not adversely uh, uh, impact our ability to meet all of our NERC compliances. That's all on cybersecurity. It has to do with a lot of our electric distribution system and also to limit the people that use any of this facility. We are not a public building like a library. Okay, we're very much different. We're not really open to the public, but we did change this in 2016 to say, if you are a town board, you can use this. You just have to have a town li liability and that would name the RMLD harmless. So with that, this is a clarification that's just basically allowing the bike event that has been here for many, many years, because that is not technically a business, a business use or training, but that wasn't the intent of it. The front parking lot is not in a NERC secured area and it's not in a NERC secured area in the building. So I'm just recommending those red lines and that's basically all the change does. That's policy 13. And then, oh. uh, go ahead, sorry. No, on, on, okay. on policy 13, I'm, I'm, so one of the things that, and, and Phil pointed out correctly, I, I had started an email question and I shouldn't have, I should have waited until the meeting came out. Um, the RMLD facility is a, it's a great facility that is, I've been in it and it's a great room to be in and then it is closed. And, you know, being a resident, I've tried to use it, use rooms in the town and I've been in sports organizations. We wanted to watch film. Uh, people wanted to get together and it's very, very limited as where to, you can go in Reading and Reading Light has a great building. Now, when you talk about NERC, I'm familiar with NERC, that whole building, you know, I understand the role of distribution in NERC and it's very finite. You know, you got a NERC room, you got a control room. Yeah, you, your access to that control room is locked behind it, it's a door. So I would expect that an, a, a definition of NERC and not allowing it to the people with the building are too, they're completely different in my point of view. Um, so I, I, I'm, what I'm looking for is allow that room access to folks. I mean, the, the sound, say you're going to get a liability waiver to use a room. That's, that's, that's extreme, right? We're, we're a public utility. We're a facility in Reading, and it has a great room to use. I, I, I guess my, my concern is it's, we're putting limitations on it that are unneeded or unwarranted. Um, so I, 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 that's, that's my statement on that. Can, can I speak to that? Yes. Um, so when I came here, it was actually open to the public. We, there was knitting clubs, there was old fashioned vintage cars. We've had vandalism in the building. We, we are not set up like a public a open public building. And we, um, we don't have custodians. We have two maintenance people. So when you use the building, it isn't just NERC compliance. It's, um, it's not set up to, to, to isolate certain areas and certain usages without having paid overtime for people to monitor it. And so we had made the decision in 2016 to limit it to all, all towns in our service territory and any committee that's covered under their liability uh, to protect the RMLD and its facilities and to, you know, use the building as it's intended, which again is not the intention of it being like an open library. That was the reason why it was originally changed. Well, and, and, and you know, today's technology with cameras, we can protect the facility. If someone does vandalism, they could very easily be corrected um, or identified anybody who goes into an uh, in, in inappropriate area. So I think cameras, um, as the, you know, the use and, and having someone, maybe there's a room fee that gets associated with it. But again, we don't want to make it prohibitive. So I think that, you know, the running light and, and again, I'm opening up discussion for everybody. Yeah. I just want to see that room used for other folks. Uh, you know, I, I, do, do I want to see it used for business? No, but I think if you're a community organization, that should be an, uh, an open room and, and available for you to use because it does have some good, it has good resources that you can use. And, you know, we could set up a schedule. I, I, I would not want to vote on that right now, personally. Uh, Mr. So Chair. Mr. Chair. Yes. 
Um, yeah, I, I just want to kind of basically echo what you're saying, and I, I think it I think it's worth taking another look at that policy and splitting the difference a little bit with the concerns Colleen's articulating. But I also I, I agree with the spirit of what you're saying, especially this is now this big new patio out back, and it is a very big building, and um, I think there should be a way to allow it to be more open, and especially maybe there's an energy education piece that we can be doing. Um, it's a, a display in there or something that's helps kids learn stuff. Sure. Uh, maybe a proper suggestion is once COVID ends, maybe we can revisit the policy at that point. I mean, there's no, there's no way anybody's getting into the building right now, but maybe we can revisit this particular policy at a later date. And, and does Phil have perspective from all the years of like how any problems or whatever? You're on mute, Phil. You're on, you're on mute, Phil. Still on mute, Phil. About that, I, know, I keep forgetting. <laughs> there were problems in the building, as, as Colleen mentioned, there was vandalism. We had people parked illegally in places out in the parking lot that blocked people from getting in and getting out. Um, you know, particularly some of the buildings in the back, some of the, the, the uh, fire equipment was, would not have been able to get in to the back area. So we had to be aware of that very much. And, and you know, it comes down to, you know, what's our purpose? You know, is our purpose to be good neighbor, you know, provide for all these groups? Are, are we in the, the wires business? You know, we're in the wires business. And that's kind of what the decision that we drove with the decision that the board made back at that time. You know, so, I mean, can we revisit the issue? I'm no, no, no objection to revisiting the issue. Um, it's just that I'm concerned with, you know, how the, how the building is going to get used. You know, and whether there's going to be any, a detriment to the use of the building. Can I add what we do use the building for right now that comes under the policy? So, for example, the police department runs their RAD, all of their RAD um, self-defense programs come in. So that's for the public, but it's sponsored by the police department that comes under the town. So they get to come in and they get to use the facility. So it's those types of groups. We also sponsor a lot of training for technical engineering at other MLPs that come in and use the building. We would, in most cases, are in attendance in that, but sometimes we're not, so we allow those type of uses. Um, so there are uses, but they're they're generally limited to, um, you know, limiting the amount of money that we spend on on costs that are not related to directly related to the business, um, unless they they fit into these special cases under towns and boards. So um, I, I would just ask that if, if you're okay with the clarification, because technically it wasn't wrong, the bike event has been here forever and I'd still like to have it out front and the first sentence kind of makes it sound like without the comma that if it's not business related, they can't do that. And that wasn't the intent of it. So if that's okay, uh, I don't know if you want to say it's okay, and then we after COVID, I can put it on the list to bring it back, and we can revise it again. Sure, I say um, we can make a motion right now to allow the bike event to occur. What did you ask for? What are you looking for? Yeah, are you a motion to? Because all I'm changing it is technically so that the bike event, so that the front parking lot can be used by a town or a board or a committee with that liability, but it can be for public use for like a bike event. That's the red line change. Is that what's in the, that's what's in the policy that you've got here? Yes. Okay. So, um, it, it, yeah. so what am I doing? I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I can, I'm if we're gonna I move that we uh, accept the policy with the uh, changes as included in the document of which we have received in the agenda. Is that policy three or policy 13? That's po policy 13, we didn't vote policy on- Policy 13, policy 13, what we're voting on. Yeah. I'll second that. As, as in the agenda. Okay, take a roll call vote. Mr. Stempeck, aye. Ms. Vecino, aye. Albert, aye. Marlena, aye. Goldray. May I ask a se second to that? John. Uh, I, I second it. Uh, John, okay. step back. Thank you. May I ask a question, Chair? Um, would you like me to have the next review date instead of putting in a date? Would you like me to say when the Board of Health opens the building or something like that? Or 
make it next <laughs> year? Or what would you like me yes, to do? Yes, Colleen, that would be excellent. Thank you. Is that okay? Does that have the, okay. Okay, the last one I have, uh, it's, you don't have a copy of it. I'm just gonna speak to it for a second is policy 19. Now, now we have two changes. So it, I'll, I'll present it uh, to you that you can read for the next meeting. Um, but we did just talk about policy 19 change that would, um, hold on one second. What did we just talk about? There was a policy 19 change that had to do with how we're voting in what order that the person that's gonna be chair is not up for election. That's actually in policy 19. So I'm going to be, we just kind of voted on that one and there's a mistake in it. There's a section that has the committees uh, and actually like the GM committee got dissolved. I, what I'd like to do is take that section out, make it an attachment. So anytime we add a committee or we dissolve a committee or how we're, if we wanna make a change of the, the AP process or things like that, because we'll mark it up with exactly how it's done and we can vote on it next month. But I can also add in there what you just spoke about um, and, and Commissioner Talbot said about uh, the, making the next chair so that they're not the ones that are going through re-election, correct? With correct. That was the spirit of it, yep. Yeah. Okay, and, and I'm gonna take the committees and stuff, the audit committee and everything and put it in attachment. So if that changes, we don't have to look at the whole the whole policy will just be that section. Okay. Okay, so I think I still need a vote on no changes for three and 16. Okay, you ready for the motion? Okay, move uh, that policy three safety committee be scheduled for the next periodic review without change. Second. Okay, roll call vote. Mr. Stempeck, aye. Mr. Vecino, aye. Mr. Talbot, aye. Marlene Abita, aye. Ms. Golder, aye. Move that policy six, drug-free workplace, be scheduled for the next periodic review without change. Second. Roll call, Roll call vote, please. I was too, too quick, John. I'm learning. Gotta get my, gotta get my words yeah. down here. And, and, and Bob, usually you say, after the second, you say, is there any discussion on this? And then we vote, but that's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Mr. Step back I okay. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> okay. Roll call vote. Let's go. Mr. Step back I. Ms. Messino, I. Talbot, I. Marlene Abita, I. Told her, I. So now policy 13 moved that the Board of Commissioners approve policy 13 facilities use as presented on the recommendation general manager to be reviewed when the building is, when the Board of Health allows the building to be open again. Second. Any further discussion? Okay, roll call vote. Mr. Stempeck, aye. Ms. Pacino, aye. Talbot, aye. Marlene Abita, aye. Mr. Coulter, aye. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, item number seven, power supply update. Uh, Mr. Underhill, if you may. Good evening. Okay, next slide, please. So this is basically a uh, continuation of a uh, slide we started last year, and it's showing uh, where this year's loads are fitting between uh, what we used as an e, e forecast for the budget and where we actually finished for 2020. And so far this year, we're running about 2.4% below the e, &E budget numbers, and we're running 2.3% above uh, where we were last year. So uh, we're showing uh, an uptick in load, uh, but not as uh, 
optimistic as we had uh, put in the power supply budget. And a lot of this is weather driven uh, when we look at uh, what happens in uh, January, February, and March. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, very quickly, uh, we are already off to a good start this year. Uh, we have experienced in both January and February uh, actual power supply costs uh, below the uh, budgeted amounts, and we're starting to see uh, a pretty good cumulative uh, differential. Uh, this is the sum of the energy capacity and uh, transmission expenses that we're seeing. Uh, next slide, please. Half our power supply cost is in energy. And uh, what we're seeing is that in both January and February, uh, we have um, been above where or better than uh, where we had budgeted things. So we do have a positive cumulative uh, differential there. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is capacity. Capacity's cost us a little bit more uh, than we anticipated, but uh, when we're talking a 70 to 75 million dollar budget, uh, and we're talking uh, 50 to 75 thousand dollars cumulative at this point in the year, uh, we're we're not talking anything to be concerned about. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, transmission, uh, we're actually uh, showing that we are uh, ahead of the game. And I believe that in February, uh, we actually received a credit uh, from National Grid uh, for transmission, for subtransmission expense. And National Grid uses a formula rate. So every month, uh, their values uh, fluctuate. It is not a uh, consistent. Uh, amount that we expect to be billed. So uh, next slide, please. This is uh, indicative of how our portfolio is performing. The black line uh, is the forecasted load and the top of the bar chart indicates where our actual loads ended up. Uh, so uh, what we see is that in January, uh, our actual loads uh, were slightly under the budget. And in February, uh, our uh, actual uh, loads were uh, slightly above uh, the budgeted amounts. And you can see uh, where the generation is uh, from each of our portfolios, uh, or from each of our uh, portfolio resources. And NextEra is uh, by far the largest uh, component of our budget. Uh, the nuclear units performed well. The um, next era units uh, were good and our market share was uh, within the tolerances that we built into the budget for risk mitigation. So uh, next slide, please. And I will now hand it over to Mr. Phipps. Well, uh, next slide, please. So we're going to talk about just following up on, uh, on Chuck's comment in terms of power supply. We're going to talk about a, uh, an, another power portfolio addition. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that and ask for a motion after that. That'll be the slide in just a moment. And then we'll talk a little about the, the climate bill and policy 30 update. Uh, the emphasis there is going to be more on the retail side and then uh, set the stage for the last one, which ties into the policy 30 revision one update, but uh, start uh, the dialogue on the renewable choice. Those will be the three topics that we talk about here for a few moments. Uh, next slide. So um, if you could shrink that down just to, that'll work. Perfect. Um, so there we go. Great. So um, as you know, right, uh, in our power portfolio, um, we try uh, from the perspective of uh, risk mitigation and stability to uh, have a significant portion of our uh, power supply and their long-term uh, long contracts. 
And uh, obviously in the context of the uh, climate bill, what we used to call Roadmap 2050, uh, we've spent quite a bit of time the past several months talking about that. Um, but with that now being law, um, there's a lot of interest in, in terms of uh, securing power supply from non-carbon resources. Uh, non-carbon is the new metric based on the new bill. And um, so we, uh, as you remember from the last meeting, um, we are pursuing a hydro facility in Connecticut um, and we're getting further down the road based on the approval you guys gave us last month. Um, in that discussion, um, there's another facility. There's not many of these hydro facilities in New England that are available, but uh, there's a, a facility also under the control of Gravity Renewables. If you remember Gravity Renewables, these uh, guys focus exclusively or almost exclusively on, uh, on hydro facilities. Um, they look at the, they take the long game like we do. Um, they look to make these facilities uh, run well and be uh, uh, environmentally friendly. So this particular facility uh, is one that is uh, just across the border, uh, up near Saratoga, Saratoga Springs in, uh, in New York, just across the, uh, the Hudson. In fact, it is at the confluence of the Hudson and uh, the Batten Kill Rivers. It's a rural recreational area. That picture on the left is the actual facility. Um, what's noteworthy about that is that it is a natural waterfall and the dam is at the very top. So it is, uh, it is not a facility as we think about uh, environmental issues. It's uh, not a facility that uh, will require any sort of a fish ladder. There's no natural fish migration up this particular part of, uh, of the river system. Um, it was uh, established back in 1925. So it's a pretty, uh, well, it's a well-established uh, uh, facility. Gravity acquired it back in 2019. They're uh, just completing up this year a multi-year upgrade since they purchased it, which is typical what they do when they uh, acquire new facilities or existing facilities and, and renovate them and renew them. Um, there's uh, a, <clears throat> because it is, uh, it was licensed back in uh, the early nineties under a FERC license. Again, the FERC license is a, uh, obviously a federal program, national program. So there's a lot of uh, requirements and documentation, all publicly filed uh, documents. Um, this looks like a very clean facility from a, an environmental perspective um, and also from a reliability perspective. As we look at it, we're looking at this one also being a 25 year term. Uh, we would probably start it uh, with your approval, of course, to uh, look at taking power from it starting in the, this summer, summer 2021. It would represent, um, uh, it's a seasonal uh, uh, um, river, um, but it, uh, in total, it represents about 5.5% of our portfolio. So it's big enough to make it of interest to us, um, but it's not a significant portion. Um, it also has, which is important to us, Connecticut class um, one um, certificates. And that is important um, in terms of how we uh, define um, uh, non-carbon energy, and it's also critically important in terms of uh, our requirement to start reporting on an annual basis the, uh, the compliance relative to the climate bill. Um, the pricing is very similar, just a little bit below, but it's very similar to what um, the other project is and our uh, average uh, hydro cost uh, in our portfolio. Um, and so uh, we want to move forward on this project. We want to move forward, forward fairly quickly, as we talked about before. There's a limited number of these um, uh, non-carbon facilities and uh, given our relationship and our size, we'd like to move fairly quickly. So I wanna just pause at this point in this presentation and ask if it's appropriate to uh, ask for a motion for approval to move forward with this project. Okay. Uh, I'd just like to make a, if I, Mr. Chair, if I may make a comment. Yes, please, John. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that we've researched this uh, facility extensively um, to make sure that there's no environmental impacts uh, that could come back to haunt us. Um, and what I mean by that is, uh, have we done any survey of, for example, the local newspapers for the past two years to make sure no one has uh, filed anything? I mean, I know I realize there's filed public documents, but uh, are there any kind of community concerns that we should be aware of? Um. Uh, on that particular note, we are uh, just starting our due diligence process. We didn't want to get ahead of you, but the environmental in the context of everything we've been through in the past six months is a critical issue for us, not just for now, but looking down the road. Um, so we will do that due diligence, but also, uh, as, as, um, as you guys are aware, the FERC process is also extremely stringent. And what I, what I didn't mention is that this particular facility that Gravity will be starting next year, another FERC relicensing process. Um, so it will again be under uh, pretty tight, tight, 
tight scrutiny, but we will do the appropriate due diligence as well. Uh, good. Thank you. Good, good caution. And, and, and just as an aside, um, I've gone trout fishing on the Baton Kill. It's a yeah. beautiful, beautiful river. <laughs> <laughs> it's known for that. It is. Uh, Greg, quick question. Um, yep. On this, it, it, it's obviously flow dependent on, on this river. Do you pay regardless if, if it's a drought? Are we still, do you still pay in the contract or is it just a, 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 if we're, it flows, we're, it goes? We're, we're, yeah, we're paying on what gets delivered. What, what is important from that though, Bob, and we talked a little about that in the last discussion is, you know, to make sure that it matches um, our, uh, our requirements, uh, both um, on and off peak um, on a daily basis, but also seasonal. And it obviously has a seasonal uh, pattern to it. Um, and so what we've, we, the good thing about this one is it, they have some scheduling capability in terms of um, not, not a lot, but they have some scheduling capability on a, on a day by day basis, um, okay. not so much a seasonal basis. So we try to make sure that that matches our, um, our portfolio needs, but it is a, it is a factor on hydro. So we, we couldn't ever be all hydro, but having that as a piece of our portfolio makes a lot of sense. Okay. All right. Is there any further discussion? You ready for a motion? Okay. You ready for a motion? Yes, sir. Oh. Okay. So just to address John's point, should we actually be putting in the motion, I'm thinking after the word execute a contract, put in there after, add after that, after proper due diligence, should we be adding that as part of the motion? Do that sounds that appropriate. No. Okay, that so I'll, I'll make the motion then. Move to the Board of Commissioners vote to accept the general manager's recommendation to execute a contract after proper due diligence with gravity renewables for energy, including associated certificates from a hydro facility in New York on the recommendation of the citizen advisory board and the general manager. Second. Is there any further discussion? Okay. Done heard, uh, move for a roll call vote. Mr. Stempeck, aye. Ms. Bessina, Talbot, aye. Marlena Bita, aye. Mr. Boulderay. Motion passes. Okay. Very good. Mr. Coulter, if I may continue, Chairman. Yes, sir. Great. Next slide, please. So uh, obviously, recently we spent a lot of time on the wholesale side. Um, and as you know, uh, we have responsibility for the retail side of the business as well. Um, that when we continue to spend time on it, even though we have not been talking about that much lately at these uh, presentations. So just a quick update. Um, Colleen did mention a few things that are coming down the road. Obviously the climate bill is uh, with its uh, focus on electrific, both electrification and also non-carbon sources. Um, it is, uh, it will have a significant impact in terms of how we think about the business. And I say the business, the retail side as well, the wholesale side going forward. And obviously it's, it's not new, but we're starting to dig into that. One of the things that we're looking at is updating our forecast models um, in the context of electrification in terms of the load. And then obviously, you know, as, as Chuck mentioned, how we backfill that uh, with purchase power. So one of the items here just to keep in mind is that the rebate program that uh, we've had in place for quite some time and we made a lot of changes to it last year. And as uh, Colleen mentioned in our opening comments, we continue to look at that. Um, one of the things that's happening is that the air source heat pump, which is focused on the HVAC, um, on the residential and small commercial side of our business, um, it, is an, it is a component of the electrification and the drive toward non-carbon. It is actually um, embedded in the, uh, the climate bill, as are some implications on, uh, on transportation as well, but those all impact um, our retail load. And so one of the things that we're in our forecast in our model, we're looking at, uh, at least initially, uh, about a 1% increase per year over the next 10 years. So by 2030, um, after, a, after a decade of fairly flat load growth, um, we anticipate starting to see load growth creep up again. Um, as you see in that second bullet, the HVAC, the, the air source heat pump, those applications um, have uh, started to uh, increase uh, in these past few months. We were averaging late last year and into January about 10 per month, and now we're looking at about 30 per month. Um, that's all good news. Um, the other element that you're going to see on all of this is that it's going to have impact on our uh, on our rates. And uh, as Colleen mentioned, we are finishing up a cost of uh, service study. We'll have more details on that output next month. 
Um, but there's generally speaking, our costs continue to go up and it's driven by, as you can see a couple items here, um, how we think about our, uh, our incentive program and our rebate program to drive that electrification. That's a factor that drives it. Um, there's also uh, obviously the operating costs continue to go up on a regular basis. As Wendy's mentioned in the past, they average about 3% per year. Um, we're looking at that energy conservation and electrification fund that talks about the rebates. Right now, we are uh, at a tenth of a cent per kilowatt hour, which is below on a rate level, um, the average, both from uh, our other MLPs as well as um, uh, the IOUs. Um, given the size, though, we tend to collect more money and spend more money. So our, our rebate program is pretty comprehensive, and it's, uh, I think it's actually the largest of the, all, all the MLPs. But to support the ongoing growth, we will be coming back most likely with a recommendation to move that from a tenth of a cent to three tenths of a cent per kilowatt hour. We'll have more details on that, but just to give you an idea, that's another component. Um, that item C there is um, obviously our transition, and I'll talk about that in just a moment, our transition to start retiring uh, an increasing portion of our certificates, um, and the certificates include directs. Um, that's going to have an impact in terms of how we uh, uh, handle the um, the energy cost that, that Chuck walked us through a few moments ago. Um, we're also going to, as part of this rate study, uh, take a look at our solar net metering um, policies and procedures. That impacts not only the rates, but it also impacts uh, the E&O. So uh, Hamid and his team in terms of how we think about loading the, the network and how we think about building out the network. Um, and also part of that rate study is looking at rates, particularly off peak evening hours. Um, how that can help not only uh, to help drive EV growth. Uh, currently, our rebate program is focused on chargers, um, but we're looking at opportunities in terms of rates to actually be a stronger motivator in terms of, of uh, net cost to operate an EV vehicle. We'll have more on that next week, I mean, next month. But what I want you to understand is that a lot of work that's, being go that's going on right now relative to the retail side of the business. And um, we're going to present the uh, cost of service stuff at the, um, the next uh, month meeting. Next slide, please. Uh, actually, go one more slide. I'm going to come back to this one, just in terms of making the order. Um, I mentioned the certificate update. Um, as, uh, as Chuck had walked through, right, there are a couple of main components, right? We have in our cost of energy, we have the energy side, the capacity side, and the transmission side. And our certificate, our historical practice of selling certificates actually reduced our energy costs. And now, obviously, from uh, what we decided uh, two months ago, our, our uh, Revision one to policy 30, we're now going to start retiring those. So the, the revenue or the cost offset to our energy costs that we have been receiving historically will, will, will taper down. Um, it's important as we go through and we need to hit compliance targets, both compliance targets uh, at the state level, but also compliance targets that we had set in part of uh, policy 30, uh, that revision one, we have that annualized line. It's going to be important that we uh, that we track very carefully our effects and our NIPA certificates as well. So we're making we're in the process of making sure that those get put into our RMLD knee pool GIS. That knee pool GIS is for the entire region. Um, so all of the uh, certificates uh, tend to get um, uh, recorded and managed there. And we want to make sure that uh, the effects and NIPA are all there. Um, as we talked about uh, last month and the month before, the policy. Um, 30, uh, revision one, our strategy is to retire certificates up to the annualized policy 30 line um, and then sell the balance. And if you guys remember in 2021, um, that target is 23% of our um, energy sales. Um, we're gonna retire those certificates. And we're gonna start that process um, this year in 2021. And um, so as we go through, if you remember that graphic there that's, that's shown there from our previous one, these certificates get generated each quarter and then that blue box below them, they get minted uh, roughly six months later. And so there is a window of opportunity for us to transact those certificates, whether we sell them or retire them um, in those windows. In that particular case, uh, the first, uh, the Q1s would be July 15th to September 15th. So it's our intention, as we mentioned last time, to report to you on a quarterly basis on um, the transactions that we are anticipating. So you're gonna see every quarter, July, October, January, and April, um, what we're planning to do, just so you know what's going on in the interest of transparency. Um, those will become part of our regular reporting every quarter and there'll be some graphics tied to it as well. Um, we envision basically having a chart that is a buy certificate, opening balance, um, uh, purchases, 
the certificates that we need to buy on a regular basis, retirements uh, and sales, and then ending balance. So you're gonna see that as a detail, as a regular slide um, each quarter. The last piece is as we finish off the end of 2020, last year, um, under the policy 30 revision zero, there is, remember that six month lag, there were approximately 15,400 certificates that were purchased um, by RMLD as part of our, our uh, purchase agreements from the fourth quarter of 2020. Um, we're in the process of selling those, um, uh, which we need to make sure we do between now and um, June 15th so that they're not forfeited. Um, those are primarily um, a bunch of Maine, Vermont, um, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, class two and class one uh, certificates of various forms. It totals about $460,000. So that is our intention to kind of finish that chapter of uh, policy 30 rev zero with that action for the fourth quarter of last year. And then starting in January, um, transition to the rev one where we're starting to retire and report to that on a regular basis. Make sense? Any questions? I'm going to jump to the last slide here in just a second. Yeah. Rob? No, go, go ahead. Please finish quick. All right. So I'm going to, if you scroll back up one slide. So this was, uh, um, I know, uh, Commissioner Abeda, you wanted to talk about this, but we just to let everybody know, we want to give you guys a, an update anyways in terms of renewable choice. Renewable choice is uh, one of the things that we had in the revision, um, revision one to the policy. Um, the intention, I'll walk through these uh, in terms of what, where we are and, and um, give you guys an update in terms of the thought process. Uh, the goal behind that, at least our original goal, was to offer a 100% non-carbon op uh, option to the ratepayers. Right now, just given the way that we are retiring on an annualized basis, X percent, um, all the ratepayers will be participating up to that annualized line. I mean, just the way we've structured the policy, everybody participates. What we intended to do for the renewable choice is to allow um, ratepayers to uh, participate incrementally above that annualized line, and the goal would be 100% non-carbon option. At some point, we might option we might offer a 75%, but that's down the road. So right now, we're basically structuring a 100% non-carbon option for ratepayers. Um, so keep in mind, this would be incremental above the existing annualized line. Um, on that note, the new, given, given the climate bill, the new metric is carbon, right? So non-carbon, we think the more appropriate name for this is going to be non-carbon choice, just to be real clear in terms of, of how we're thinking about this. Just so you know, um, we've, had, we, we've been having this discussion um, since last summer with two of our larger industrials, focused primarily on uh, what they and us were calling a green tariff. Um, but the intention there was to provide to them um, certificates, or I should say certificates, a mechanism for them to basically report to their supply chain and to their corporate management uh, the amount of power that's green. And so we've been linking that to a potential wind project that we're in the middle of uh, securing, um, as well as how we process it through the, uh, the logistics of, our, um, of the climate bill. There's a lot of details, um, and you'll hear this, and you've heard this all along from, from Wendy, you'll hear this again later on. But in terms of all the accounting, in terms of how we how we implement that, that has to be uh, digested, as well as DPU filing um, consideration as well. So there's a lot going on that we've already been working on. Um, the guardrails on this also is important. That remember, we as RMLD and and the whole entity, um, we are the compliance requirement from the climate bill is um, retirement of X percent or not X percent, but X numbers of. Uh, of certificates. So we want to make sure we structure this in terms of maintaining the ownership in the RMLD NEPOL GIS account so that we hit the state requirements, yet still allow the customers to, pers to persist or have the option to persist uh, per, um, participate in uh, a non 100% non carbon option. The two mechanisms that we're looking at, and I probably should have driven a, um, a chart for this, but basically the two concepts right now are retire more and buy more. The retire more basically, if you think about it, uh, our stacked bar chart, we have roughly 40% of our 2021 portfolio has certificates with it. And for this year, um, with our internal policy, we're going to retire 23% of those certificates. The idea behind retire more is to whatever who, the, the funds that are basically associated with this uh, non carbon choice would get applied um, 
to that uh, to that stack so that we would actually retire a higher percentage of our certificates and not sell them. Um, that's one scenario that was highly likely. We'll give you some details next month, um, but that's the retire more option. The buy more option is we have 40% this year and it keeps going up each year based on the contracts in terms of what we're securing um, with associated certificates. And the thought process, particularly for the commercials, this kind of goes back to the green tariff, is to use those funds to actually buy more certificates. So we think a mixture of both of those will fit into it, whether it's a commercial industrial or a residential, but uh, just for to kind of a placeholder, um, there's a lot of work that's been done on this already. Um, we've got a lot of, it's a fairly complex uh, uh, puzzle, um, but we've made a lot of progress in terms of figuring out how that might look. So that's mainly an, an update, um, not a final report. Um, it'll realistically, it'll be probably another two months at least before we finalize that. And uh, so that's just a quick update on that topic. Questions and comments? Jim? Mr. Chair? Yes, Phil, please. Yeah, so if I wanted to go into this, I mean, you know, I would have to sign up as I understand this. Is that correct? I would sign up like similar to what we had with the, similar to what we had with the solar choice, one and two. You're muted, Greg, by the way. Yep, mm -hmm. yep, yep, exactly right. Keep going. So, I imagine you've got some sort of cost that I would be subject for. Do you have any idea of what the additional cost would be that we're talking about with the ratepayers? Now, I bring this in context of the study that we had that's been cited many times if you want to pay more. So, uh, you know, I'm wondering what we're actually looking for maybe cost on this, the additional cost to I as the ratepayer if I want to go into this program. So, so Phil, that's one of the modeling that uh, Chuck and I and our team are, are walking through. Um, that cost depends heavily in terms of which certificates, um, which RECs, but I'll use certificates because that's the broader term, are associated with this 100% non-carbon. Um, effects are less valuable than Mass or Connecticut Class 1. So we haven't laid out the model completely yet. Um, we're working through that analysis, um, but you're, you're exactly right that that raises a question and not only keep in mind that the value of those change over time, literally um, every two weeks, um, the value of those certificates. And so we wanna figure out something that has some longevity and related to that is the ability for people to opt in or opt out, particularly if they jump in and then make a change later, we have to make sure that, that we accommodate that as well. So there's a lot of moving parts. I don't have a specific answer, um, but we'll have a little more analysis realistically uh, month after next. Okay, all right, very good, thank you. Uh, Greg, if I, if I could please ask, I, I know you on the retail part of the policy, um, you did a great job explaining <clears throat> metrics. Are you going to put, is there any way for you to put a metric behind the retail side on, on how we're doing on incentives? Like, you know, I, um, I don't know if a bar chart, you know, like I said, are, are we're running at the end of the amount of money that the state's going to supply maybe a simple bar chart, like, you know, there's a hundred thousand dollars left or, or whatever um, on, on the retail side. And then on, you know, as people are getting more engaged in the rebates and EV and air pumps, you know, again, the, the same thing. If we, if we have an X amount, you know, are we going to be able to see, like you said, you're, we're seeing a potential increase from, um, you know, from 0.01 to 0.03. So, you know, is there any metric or can you, can you think about that? Yeah, yeah well, well, actually, um, so we've uh, updated our annual budget. We put a lot more detail into it um, to account for the, the growth, um, which is part of the reason why we have a pretty solid idea that that three tenths, you know, from one tenth to three yes. tenths of the program supplies itself. But the other thing that, that raises in terms of how we think about the mechanism in terms, do we let that float? Do we, do we tie it into a mechanism that, that adjust on a rolling quarterly, you know, every three month basis. Um, so we, we've got a couple of models that we're playing around with um, and looking at the impact from a rate payer perspective and then from, you know, the, uh, the impact in terms of the, the economics of the business and aggregate. So we will, one of the things that we will be doing is, you know, what's the status of the rebates over time? How does it compare to our budget, um, the rebate budget? So not only in terms of number of rebates, but the dollars of the rebates. In the case of the air source heat pump, that's, tar that's tied to, the rebates are tied to the size of the unit, not the number of units. So if it's a two-ton unit versus a four-ton unit, the rebates are different. So we've actually got some um, 
we've actually got some bar charts, et cetera. Um, and yeah, we can we could put those into either the monthly or the quarterly updates in terms of where those programs look like because it will become a bigger piece of the, the budget, not a huge piece, but a bigger piece. So we'll take that as an action item. Is there any other questions? All right. If not, if we could move on to item 10, uh, Hamid. Uh, um, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, I just, okay. I had in here, um, uh, Commissioner uh, Beta wanted to talk about opt in, opt out. Um, I am very sorry. I had rolled up beyond your line. My first faux <laughs> pas. Uh oh, I'm quiet. I'm quiet already. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. Go ahead, Peter, please. All right. Let me see if I can share my screen. It's only three and a half minutes. And it's in line with what Greg was just talking about. Um, Everything's a little slow. Okay, so I'll just read it. It's just a few pages. It's about maximizing the revenue from renewable choice or are there, are data. What? Would you like me to, to share the screen? Oh, you can't see it? No, we cannot. No, no we can't. It, it, did you want to email it to uh, Kathleen? I, she could put it up. Yeah, I have it. I'll put it up. Okay. Okay. I got uh, Kathleen. I used share, and it's up. Uh, maybe mine is just so slow. I whatever. I don't know. Thank you, Kathleen. Seeing it now. You're welcome. Can you see it now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So these few slides are about paying for renewable energy. And um, we wanna maximize as much revenue as we can because there was a lot of data in the survey that the customers did in 2020 um, where um, they said they did want aggressive action. 67% of them responded that they would like RMLD to be aggressive with respect to setting goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and Kathleen, 61... Kathleen, could you move the slide up to the second slide, I think? There we go. Okay, sorry, sorry, Marlene, we couldn't okay. see it. No, so, I'm sorry. The okay. residential and commercial rate payers both wanted aggressive action with respect to reducing greenhouse gas emissions with 67% of residential RMLD respondents saying that and 61.8% of the commercial respondents saying that. And on slide three, can you see that? Mm -hmm. yes. By an almost two to one margin, customers say they are willing to pay more with the big number being that 58.3% are willing to pay between five and 25% more for renewable energy and 31.4% saying they're willing, not willing to pay more and 10.3% saying that they didn't answer the question or they just didn't know. So on slide four, um, it's about what do we do with this? And what is the appropriate rate policy for when 58% of the rate payers are willing to pay more? How can RMLD capture this potential revenue stream? And how can RMLD accelerate the transition to cleaner energy? So in slide five, there was a study in 2018 by the National Renewable Energy Lab I think it's an arm of the Department of Energy. And they say that when utilities use opt-in rates, only five to 20% of the customers participate. But when utilities use opt-out rates, about 85% or more of customers do tend to stay in. So even with opt-out, customers will still have choice and they can say no to the premium. Um, Don Newell is the general manager 
at Wellesley Munilight. They tried an opt-in program, but only 10% of their ratepayers were participating. So a year ago, town meeting intervened and said, we'll try an opt-out program. It officially rolls out on July 1st of this year. Um, he said that I could call him and see how it's going throughout the summer in terms of numbers. Um, they do expect 80 to 85% of their residents to remain enrolled. And the rate, he said it's not firm, but he thinks it's gonna be a 4% surcharge to help them generate their goal of $500,000 per year for battery storage and solar arrays on municipal buildings. Um, Is there another slide? Yes, yeah. slide. Well, that was six. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. Do you and want me to go to the next one now? Put up six for a second. Okay. Since I just read it. Sorry about that. So they had, just to review the Wellesley one, they had 10% of people responding when they had an opt in program. And so far, it looks really positive for their opt out program. So, slide seven. Should we, the RMLD Commission, consider an opt out program? I think our ratepayers have spoken through that survey and the national data from the NREL study shows that it does work and we can still protect those who are unwilling or really more importantly, unable to pay more. And we could explore an opt out rate structure to accelerate clean transition through data driven policy. And that's it. So questions or comments? I have a I have a question and a comment, if I may, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, also, to add to that, my, my sister lives in Westford, and she gets from I think it's National Grid a similar thing where they they come at you saying, "I'm going to raise your rates five percent. If you don't want me to, you don't have to take it, or if you want, I can volunteer for ten percent." And it's sort of what Commissioner Beach is saying is that when you put it that way people tend to say, okay, I'll, I'll spend an extra five, 10 bucks a month. And, but they can say no, but it's just, it's, if it's, if you do it and present it as an opt out where it, it's, it's, it's imposed, unless they say no, you're going to get a lot more participation and a, a lot more funds in to capture all of this revenue that people are willing to give and, and help Greg and Colleen, you know, buy the recs and do the stuff that Greg was just talking about, you know, and if we do just the opt in, which I think is what the policy 30 says, the data says we're not going to get big participation just because people have to go to the work. So that's all. I, and I, my sister experienced this in Westford in, in an IOU context. It's, 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 it's shown to work. So thank you for that, Commissioner Bita. Uh, um, Mr. Chair, if I can make a comment as well. Yes, please. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of torn between the two, quite frankly, and in, uh, in, in, um, in the sense that uh, if there's an experiment going on already with, was this Wellesley who was doing this? Yep. Uh, so uh, we could one, uh, wait to see what Wellesley does and see whether they actually do achieve it or not. Um, or, you know, the, the opt, the opt out process. Um, I, I worry about people who don't have, let's say computers and don't realize what opt out or opt in means. And if we could take care of them, then that certainly provides a path forward for doing this. Uh, but um, I think it's uh, the ref my reflection on the survey that was taken is that if people were pure and true to their, you know, X number of over 50% decided they wanted to pay more, that you should be getting them to pay more on the opt-in uh, uh, option. But I'm, I'm ambivalent between the two, quite frankly. Um, even even with sort of the data that you've shown from the uh, the DOE was a DOE uh, data. Yeah, NREL of the DOE. But didn't we try an opt in and it was underserved? I don't, I'm not aware of that. Not aware of that. What about um, uh, on our time you know, use like, meters? Right, isn't it? That's our time use meters. We we do opt in, and I, we only have a few hundred. Um, and I know that's something that we want to have people take. We have 26,000 meters and only what, how many hundreds have taken it? 
five or six hundred after ten years. Right. So there, I mean, this is something where we would like people to take this program because it, it helps suppress the peak. So it's just a behavioral thing, right? Everybody I talk to about time use meters, oh, that's a great idea, but do they go make the phone call? You know, oh. all right, that's it. Yeah. That, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, that that's it. I mean, it's a behavioral issue. Uh, so I'm not sure. I, I, I think oh. I'd have to think about it a little bit more. In other contexts then, in researching opt-out programs, when a company offers a 401k or a healthcare, it's always opt-out. They just automatically enroll you. And that's how they get participation. Yeah. Well, I think we're talking slightly apples and oranges. Between of course, but um, just to liken to the people who you say might not have a computer or something like they are familiar with opt-out programs, maybe in other contexts and they do it. But if, um, the, if they can call and to opt out, I, I, would that help appease the concern for people who don't have a computer? Well, Mr. Chair, I, I, uh, if I may. Uh, yes, please. I think any form of communication, Marlena, would be great uh, in terms of telling them how the program would work and trying to make it as simple as possible so that you could do the opt out or opt in. Um, and I know you do, the opt out is where you're, you're coming from. And uh, so that I, I don't know, I, I mean, maybe running a test case on this, um, you know, in terms of not necessarily focus groups, uh, but maybe a subsector of, of the population in terms of seeing how they would receive it. Uh, maybe a, uh, a more interesting way of discerning whether they'd be able to do it or not. I mean, you've, you've already got a population that says they want it, over 50% want it. Uh, so uh, for them, I think it's, it would be a no brainer to opt in. Uh, and so uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to be negative on it. I'm really just- No, trying it's to fine. And I just want to tell you, you mentioned Wellesley. Um, so at town meeting, it, it is relevant that it passed overwhelmingly that they wanted to pursue this. So that was one measure. And now that it's already April, he said he's gotten a few phone calls, maybe 2% of the population who have called and said, I want to be on that opt-out list for sure, meaning get me off of it. But he's feeling really good about it. And he's, he's been there for decades. Um, but again, it doesn't officially roll out until July 1st, but that's around the corner and they're all aware of it. So um, we'll definitely follow up with him. Right. Uh, and, and another comment is it, it's your perception of writing light, right? If you do an opt in or opt out, right? If you do an opt out, that could be that could be bad press, right? Unless it's communicated in a in a precise and prolonged manner, I think you could get a you could get a press bomb. You know, it, it's just j just looking at Palmer, right? When Palmer got close to happening. And uh, it hit the press, it, ex it exploded. So, I mean, good to talk about it, but when you go to execute, it's something, it's something different. So I think that that, that it, it could stir the pot. I, I that's, that, again, that's, that's my opinion. If you, people might perceive it as a, as a, as you know, Hey, you just, you're just raising the rates without asking. Right. Uh, it could be, it could be definitely a bad, a bad perception on rating light as well. Do we ask them if we can raise rates? I mean, uh, no, I, I no. It, it, it would be it would be our decision, but based on uh, yes, Clint, those, people could, those people could say, please take me off. Those I agree with you, Bob. It, it would have to be preceded by a long communication. Right. Yeah, you've got it. But anybody yes. who didn't like it can say no. And if it's like Wellesley's four percent, I think my bill is like a hundred bucks a month. It'd be like four dollars. You know, I mean. I mean, just using that as a rough, I mean, this is not, not huge money we're talking about here. It's a few bucks a month, and, but this, Colleen? Uh, can I just make a suggestion? I mean, I think this is really a good idea to look into. If allow us to look at a program like this and maybe next month we can say, okay, here's what an opt-out program looks like. Here's the impact. Here's what we could buy to make that happen. And here's what an opt-in program would look like. And that's kind of similar to what we did with the time of use meters. I think back when we looked at that, because that was a good idea too, but at that time, a time of use meter was about another $200 on top of what a regular meter costs. So there was a lot of other 
concepts that went into that, even though time of use opt out was a great idea. You know what I mean? So as technology changes and as the price comes down, we can keep looking at that. So if you wouldn't mind, can we have um, staff yes. take a look at this and maybe present it next month? Yeah. Please. Great idea. Good idea. Good idea. Great idea. I was okay. going to suggest the same thing myself. She was calling and beat me to it. Oh, I'm I'm sorry, Phil. I stole it from okay. you. Sorry. Okay. All right. That's why you're the general manager. Sure, Phil. No, sure. <laughs> That's it. Okay. All right. So we got, a, we got a lot of stuff left. We got a, a long way to go and a short time to get there, right? So we got, um, all right, Hamid, if you want to take it away. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And uh, let me just start by saying to Commissioner Bida, welcome aboard. Looking forward to meet you in person as soon as the pandemic uh, mess is over <laughs> and we are mm -hmm. over crisis. <clears throat> anyway, Thank you. I'm proud, mm -hmm. proud to present uh, uh, the ENO report. Uh, Kathleen, could you please put the slides up? Okay, the first slide. Okay, the first slide, as you see, at, as I'm reporting at uh, every board meeting, these are the reliability indices. Basically, there are three indices that you know well. Uh, they determine the well being and the health of the system. These are the system average interruption duration in, index, SADI, or customer average interruption duration index, uh, KD, and system average frequency interruption, or SAFI, two durations and one uh, frequency. As you could see, for the past five years, uh, RMLD has been outperforming with respect to the national and the regional averages. Uh, the regional averages are uh, represented by the green bar, by green line, and also the national by the blue line. These data are being published by APP, American Public Power Associations. Every year we submit our, uh, actually month to month, we are submitting our outage data and outage history uh, to the, uh, to the uh, APPA, uh, they, they're gonna put that information into the very sophisticated software called e-reliability tracker. And the e-reliability tracker is comparing all the utilities regionally as well as nationally. And uh, usually in March of every year, they publish a report uh, for the previous year to see how well uh, we've been doing. So this is benchmarking for us uh, to see kind of what we're doing. As you could see, the reliability is really great. Most people, I bet they don't even remember when was the last time that they had a big outage, uh, you know, and for the most part, the RMD reliability is very strong and we're proud, proud of that. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this slide shows the causes of outages that, you know, whatever, even though our reliability is good, but well, what are the uh, uh, contributing factors? The highest contributing factor, uh, if you could see, is the weather. Uh, with respect to the past five years, the blue bars, they show the past five years averages. And you could see that, you know, this year, I mean, we've had so many, uh, last year, especially up to, up to uh, March, uh, you could see that, you know, we've had many storms with, uh, with respect to the last five years average. And that's a big, huge contributing factor to, to the uh, reliability and the outages that uh, you might have experienced due to the weather bringing trees down and, you know, damaging the equipment or the poles down. The next report, the next slide, I'm sorry. <clears throat> okay, I'm proud to announce that in 2020, RMLD uh, got received two prestigious awards uh, from the APPA. One uh, is the Reliability Award, which we, they, as I stated, they analyzed the uh, reliability data, outage data, and they're focusing only on the indices and they're telling us how well we did. And uh, the result was that our reliability is one of the best in the New England and we are very proud of that. The other award that we received was the RP3 or which stands for Reliable Public Power Provider. And basically they evaluated the policies, operational procedures, business model, planning, organizational management. They did all of that against best business practices nationwide. As you know that, you know, organizations strive to optimize performance and increase the productivities and efficiencies by following the best business practices and uh, also following the top performing industries as a role model. 
And that's been our goal at RMLD to make sure that you know, we, are, uh, we are at the top uh, performing utilities. So the next slide, please. <clears throat> These are basically the certificates for their reliability. The first award that we got, this is the fourth year in a row that we get the certificate of excellence in reliability. And we are very proud of that. Next slide, please. Okay, this uh, award that the new award that is actually, this is the second uh, RP3 award in the history of uh, RMLD. The first award was in 2006 and the second one now it's in 2020. So this award is good for three years uh, for, from May, 2021 through May, 2024. The next slide, please. So uh, the RP3 designation, which by the way, there are three levels of award. The lowest is gold. Uh, the, uh, the one uh, after that upper would be the platinum and the one above that is diamond. So diamond is the highest designation. We got the platinum. APPA designation, uh, basically uh, the key disciplines, uh, disciplines uh, in the areas that, you know, uh, that, that we were evaluated, where reliability, safety, workforce development, and also the system improvements. So there's lots of thoughts, lots of the documentations that you know, we had to provide for the, the, this process is started from May of last year and ended by December uh, 30th. Uh, we sent uh, thousands of documentations because they want to make sure what you're preaching, you're practicing. So we had to prove to them for everything, cybersecurity, physical security, uh, their succession planning, their, their financials, their system reliability planning, all safety practices, everything, all 360 degrees, whatever that you know you, <clears throat> you would consider uh, a very important area that uh, a utility, a top performing utility would be focusing on, uh, they, they evaluated us. And uh, over here, I would like to thank the other managers, you know, the Wendy Markowitz, uh, Greg Phipps and Chuck and Underhill, uh, as well as, uh, you know, Colleen, uh, our manager for their leadership contributions, because this is an all out evaluation of the organization. And this is really a big deal for every organization and they, they, they're looking forward to participate, not only just to be, get the awards, just to see that, you know, where we are with respect to other utilities so we can, you know, make sure that we are on the right track and the train is heading north. What, it, what it's not this award, it's not telling you, basically it's not telling you that the train has re reached is this the destination. What it means that if you stop uh, spending money on the reliability and also on the maintenance, very easily the train could be heading back south. So we have right plans, right operational procedures, and we are right are on the right track. I also would like to extend the congratulations to the board, both CAP members and also the board, uh, board of commissioners, RMLD board of commissioners, for the cooperation, collaborations, and the leadership that uh, led us to uh, receive these, uh, you know, high standard achievement award. Next slide, please. So basically, there are 270 uh, utilities throughout the uh, United States out of the 2000 that they have this RP3 designation. This year from New England area, uh, actually from, uh, from the entire country, uh, from, from the New England area, seven utilities participated. Uh, nationwide, 108 utilities, they participate. They actually got to receive their award. More, more participation they had, but they're going through the filtering process and only 108 out of those, which I believe about 500 or 600 utilities that have participated, only 108, uh, they, they qualified for the award. And about 47, they received the diamond, 45, they received platinum, and 16, they received gold. Uh, so, and uh, we, are pr we are proud that, you know, we achieved, uh, we, we, we got these achievements uh, in New England. And that's a good news for the people to know that you know well uh, that their money is going for a good cause and you know we are doing what we're supposed to do as the uh, representative in order to uh, make sure uh, that you know we have right programs in place uh, and money is uh, uh, spent right you know right where it should be next uh, next one please so the rp3 application these are the areas that you know the, they basically evaluated us 
in the demographic, the employee demographics, the reliability, you know, like what I said, physical security and uh, cyber security NERC uh, requirements, the indices, the safety, the workforce the, the development, the system improvements, the study that we did back in 2016 with the 20 year reliability plan. And, you know, we send all of those documents and, you know, ton of, ton of support uh, from uh, everybody across the board in, in, in our organization. <clears throat> and they evaluated and then uh, finally they got back to us in actually March, let us know, gave us a good news that uh, we got these platinum awards. Next slide, please. So uh, the press release you could see uh, on uh, on that the, the website uh, and the link to that it's uh, in the bottom of the screen. You could see the press press release for the RP3, and also if you'd like to see the RP3 uh, an uh, announcement uh, from the APPA, the link is above that, so you can you know uh, click on that and they give you the name of the utilities that they received uh, these uh, achievement awards. And to the right, you could see the plaque that we received from APPA. And this plaque is gonna be uh, installed uh, in the lobby of the RMLD. So again, uh, thank you so much for everyone, for everyone's contribution, contribution of the IRD, uh, HR, Janet Walsh, uh, uh, um, Wendy and Colleen and everybody. And specifically also, I'd like to thank Kathleen for taking the uh, ownership of this process and actually collecting documentations and doing the hard work to submit it to the APPA for consideration of this highest high, high achievement. Uh, thank you so much again. I appreciate it. And that concludes my report. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir, John. If, if I may, I would just like to say yep. congratulations, Hamid. That's an awesome accomplishment. Um, and it reminds me of the, uh, of the other sort of quality areas, such as the, the Deming Prize, you know, for quality and the Malcolm Baldridge uh, Quality Awards. Uh, very, you know, excellent programs to focus on how do you improve your processes across a broad area. And the thing that's surprising to me is that we, how do we get to the diamond level? <laughs> I don't understand. We're at the platinum, which is fabulous, but getting to the diamond is must take something extra special. But trust me, then that's our goal for the next time. And we're right, working right. hard. That's why we wanted to see where we are and how could we raise the bar. And that's what our goal is for the next time. So uh, we, that's, that's where we're heading to. And thank you so much again for your cooperation and collaboration with us and guiding us toward, you know, the, to be the art performer. So thank you all. Thank you both. Oh, you're welcome. No, just just a quick comment to, to live in a world of, of worst performing feeders and fines. I applaud the <laughs> performance here. I know exactly how hard it is to get to where you are. So kudos, kudos. All right. Um, if no more, any other questions, comments? Yes, um, Marlena. Um, if, if not, if nothing else, I know that RMLD is so reliable and, um, that's probably what everyone says about it, that I don't know anything about it, but it's reliable and it never goes out. And I think 11 years, mine's gone out once for 30 minutes and I really didn't even notice. But I was just curious about the overall application for the state that 22 or so uh, municipal light plants either never apply or I, I don't understand why they are participating. What, this is this is a uh, voluntarily uh, voluntary uh, process. They don't have to. Some utilities they don't participate because they don't have the policies and procedures, you know, organized and the plans. Like one of the toughest uh, criteria in order to get the award is the twenty-year plan. Plan. We have we got the plans for the smart grid, twenty-year plan for plans for reliability. And we got exactly all the, everything, right? It's a, like a big puzzle that we put these pieces together every year. So we have for the next 20 years, advanced planning and also for smart grid automation, optimizing processes, procedures, safety, all of those, we have that. And you have to demonstrate that 
So the uh, the board of uh, APPA, uh, they you know they they could consider you for such high achievement award. So if you don't have one of those or two of those, you're not going to get the basically the quality qualifying grade in order to uh, be considered for the award. So that's the reason for it. Thank you. You're welcome. Just to share the congratulations and uh, congratulations to everybody at RMLD on this this achievement. Is it, I'm wondering, is there anything different about now versus 2006? Like what what's different? Is there something different about what they did in 2006 versus now, or what what happens in the interim? I'm just that's the only part I'm curious about. I haven't gone to that that extent. I'm sure you know that's what we are going to review to see what was the last time. But I know one of the factors was lack of reliability planning. Uh, we didn't have, when I got here back in 2015 or 14 with Colleen, that's what we uh, realized that there is no long-term plan and lots of maintenance that, need, that we're overdue. So we needed to come up with a plan to keep the system reliable and you know, moving forward. So that was one of the factors, but and plus the requirements back then were not as stringent as they are today. Like, you know, NERC security, cyber security, physical security, and all of that, it's, it was really tough. Uh, Kathleen could tell you how many times you went back and forth, back and forth saying that, okay, yeah, you meet this qualification, you have it, but how about do, doing this? How about the policy that enforces it? How do you enforce those policies? And we had to send, uh, pages of you know documentation to tell them that basically what we're preaching we are exercising and we are doing so this time was really hard it was you know i couldn't believe we, even up until the last minute we were sending documentation proving to them that we are doing what we're preaching well congratulations again and just to clarify you know i sent around the spreadsheet because i was just curious about the state and i, I sent it without comment not because there was no, you know, I just wanted to send the data and not and yeah. save the comments and everything for the meeting um, because I think it's important to see where we stand statewide. So anyway, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, if no more comments, um, Wendy, would you like to go? Good evening and welcome, Commissioner Bida. Kathleen, are you Hi. sharing or am I? Okay, so I thought I'd um, first start with some highlights. So um, last week we had the, the next slide there, Kathleen, thanks. Oh, right there, thank you. Last week we uh, completed the financial audit and um, as usual, Melanson came in and did an excellent job. Uh, our team pulled it together and uh, we pulled it off in four days. And right now they're preparing the draft um, audited financials. We are very hopeful that the financials will be ready for a meeting with the audit committee and presented to the audit committee in May, and then subsequently presented to the CAB and the board of commissioners. Uh, so I'll have to work with uh, Kathleen and Colleen to try to um, get the audit committee scheduled. So um, this week, sales tax prepayment requirement was changed by the state of Massachusetts. So typically 20 days after the end of the month, you have, um, to get your sales tax payment in. And then Massachusetts decided that they wanted to have a prepayment. So you have to pay on the 25th day in the current month for what you're expecting to, um, to be uh, liable for, for the sales tax. So uh, when you're looking at the accounts payable, you're gonna see sales tax payment for this week, which was for March. And next week, you're gonna see sales tax payment for April. So in 2021, we're gonna end up having 13 payments. The Department of Public Utilities return is next on the uh, high priority list here. So, you know, the accounting team with the IRD and um, engineering and operations will pull that up all together and submit it. And we're going to need the uh, Board of Commissioners signatures uh, per usual. The town of Reading payment is set to, uh, to go 630-2021 for $1.2 million. And uh, estimated right now 2% net plant payments also for 630-2021 at $827 thousand dollars for all four towns. Next slide, Kathleen. 
thank you. Uh, every once in a while, I like to give you a nice picture of the cash. Um, you know, accountants love pie charts and they're very uh, attractive to look at, but really it does tell, it tells you everything you need to know about our cash situation. $57.7 million of which uh, $24.7 million in the operating fund. So you can quickly identify which uh, funds are allocating uh, well restricted for um, each topic, you know, construction, depreciation, rate stabilization, and so forth. And you can identify that uh, easily here. We are striving for three times um, operating expenses in the operating fund last year with almost $2 million under budget. You're going to see that the cash is a little higher because of the timing. And of course, uh, last year we were a little bit over on the kilowatt hour sales as well. So right now we're, we're we're handling a timing issue with cash, but it's all going to shake out. I'm certain of it. Next slide, Kathleen. Thank you. Okay, so I think it's really important um, to make everybody aware of the accounts payable process. So the first thing to say is that the um, RMLD does not have any control whatsoever of cash. The town of Reading writes all of our checks. Everything goes through the town of Reading for final review and scrutiny. So this flow chart is uh, nice to look at as far as, you know, if you wanted to really get into the detail on your own time. But in essence, what happens is in last year with the electronic, everything had to change really quickly. So in essence, what happens is the RMLD receives invoices um, via email. Some of them still coming in through the mail. We're trying to prevent that, but it's still happening. And then the, the green square in the middle is the um, RMLD accounting team. So we basically manage this process. It's, it's basically an ongoing uh, project daily and weekly in order for this to take place. So everything comes back through the accounting team to push out. So we receive the invoices and we push them out to the managers within the divisions you know, for approval of goods and services. They come back to us. We make sure that the proper signatures on it. We make sure that it matches to a purchase order if it's, um, if it's relative. And then we make sure that the general ledger account is uh, properly, properly identified. So then after that, we send it off to the uh, purchasing manager. Now that in itself has a whole nother uh, process of signatures and uh, approvals through the requisition process and the purchase order process with the contracts for, sub um, for procurement. The purchasing, the purchasing manager reviews all of the uh, purchases then she sends them back to us. The accounting team prepares the batches and gets it ready. Meanwhile, you have to understand even sending it to the managers, the purchasing manager, there's a lot of um, you know, stop and go. So we're continuously you know, troubleshooting. We're continuously in contact with the vendor. We're continuously you know, looking at scrutinizing the contract against the invoice. And then, so what happens is then the accounting team pulls all together, everything that's ready to be processed for, a, for an actual check, puts the batches in, sends the batches off to the general manager for her final approval. General manager, once again, stop and go, asking questions, making sure. Once she's happy that everything is, is in the proper order, sends it back to the accounting team, accounting team combines all the invoices, packages it nicely together, gets ready for the check file for the town of Reading. Prepares the warrant, then the uh, general manager signs the warrant, the processed invoices along with the warrant go to the board of commissioners for signature. At that point, they also have the opportunity to ask questions. They're only pulling invoices if they think it's fraudulent or illegal. So at this point, we can, you can ask questions and we can answer your questions, that's not a problem. And then at, after the approval of the warrant, then the town of Reading cut, uh, cuts the check. Before they cut the check, Definitely getting phone calls over here at RMLD. Again, scrutinizing, checking invoices, making sure lots of checks and balances. We like it that way. This is how we always check ourselves. And then um, the town of Reading cuts a check 10 days after the Friday end date, which is the warrant date. So that's basically the whole process. It is, um, it is uh, quite complex. And I think it's very important for everybody to be aware of uh, how this works. Every day if there's a deadline in order to move to the next day, just so you understand that. And I think that concludes that uh, piece of it. I didn't actually have anything to say specifically about the financials. 
you know, it's February, they're pretty flat. We're a little bit under budget right now, uh, but there's nothing really significant to report. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. I guess the first thing I would say, I see that process. Um, would you have any process improvements that you would suggest to streamline that a little bit um, to improve it? Not, not right now. <laughs> I'm going to put you on the plate, but is there is there anything that you would like to to streamline that process or suggest or you know if anybody would like to suggest? Well, I can first say that in 2020 alone, uh, the process went from paper to electronic. That in yeah. itself was yeah. was uh, was huge, <laughs> quite honestly, and it took everybody's uh, cooperation and help to make that happen. So we are continuously looking to streamline the process to make it um, more simplistic, which it's it's never gonna be simple, but you know, uh, we work with our vendors to avoid you know, the stop and go, we really do. So we are getting better at uh, making sure that the contracts are, um, that the vendors understand what the contracts say before they go ahead and send us the invoices. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the, process, the process works a lot better now, it used to be, three commissioners had to sign the warrant in the past. That's right. Yeah. Oh. Which is rather, <laughs> Put my head in the door and just <laughs> close it. Like, that's, that's good. But well, thank you. Is there any comments? Okay. Thank you, Wendy. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next item on the agenda would be the RMLD, RMLD procurement request. Okay, you want the motion? Yes, please, Phil. Okay, move that IF, IFP 2021-13 for voltage and current transformers be awarded to Gray Bar Electric Company, Inc. for $124,970 and West Coast Distribu Distribution, Inc. for $28,224 pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 164 Sections 56D on the recommendation, general manager. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. Roll call vote. No, no. You have. I think Hamid's speaking, but he's but he's muted. Oh. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Hamid. Hamid is muted. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Sir. Uh, as you recall, last year, we tested all the primary metering structures. We got about 68, 70 of them uh, throughout the system for, for the integrity and accuracy of the metering. And we realized that, you know, well, lots of these uh, equipments are uh, getting, uh, actually, they are outdated. They need to be upgraded. So these are including the PT potential transformers and CT current transformers which basically they step down the voltage from, from 13,800 to 120 volts and the current from uh, thousands of amps to five amps. So it could be measured in the electronics and control. So uh, we ordered the, the parts uh, for that and we sent the bid to 14 uh, distributors and vendors. Only four responded. And among the four, the lowest responsible responsive bidders where Gray Bar for 124,970 and Wesco for $28,224. So the total award is $453,194. Bob, I think it'd be appropriate that maybe if the, for Marlena's why this actually gets in front of the commission to vote. Maybe Colleen can maybe give a quick brief reason why this gets in front of the commission. <clears throat> Colleen, you're on mute. Yeah. Sorry. Um, we present all of the, the bids under Chapter 30 in the, for certain values that exceed 50,000 in accordance with Policy 9 um, to the board for approval. So you're going to see all the bids that come through that exceed those limitations. Um, we will also comment whether or not there's any deviation from uh, either expense budget or capital improvement plan that the board has approved if we're exceeding it. If it's a small amount, but it's been approved in the budget, then when we give the budget update, we'll talk about the previous year and why if we went over or not. 
um, that's kind of how we how we do it. But you'll you'll probably see bids like Hamid is presenting every every month. But we but when we when we meet with you, because I know everyone in staff is is looking forward to spending some time with you, Malena. We can go over each one of these details because I know it's it's kind of a lot all at once. But we'll we'll spend time with you and and bring you up to speed. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. I, I know one of the tough ones is the first time you sign off as a commissioner on the warrants, you mess it up and they have to keep, you have to do it twice and then a third time. And then someone tells you how to exactly to do it, then it's much, much easier for the next time. But it, yep. so it's a three, three taps, three rights, <laughs> sit around four times and then <laughs> push the button and you're all done. Chair, can I add to that? Uh, Marlene is actually on the May rotation. I don't know if we want to change that or. I uh, would <laughs> change or that. Or the deep end. Uh, yeah. So that, that would be tough. That okay, be we'll tough. talk about it. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Wendy. Sure. All right. Okay. okay. I think you, you need a roll call vote now. Maybe just we need a roll call vote. Mr. Stempak, aye. Mr. Pacino, aye. Albert, aye. Mr. Coulter, aye. Marlene, aye. All right. Okay. Next Thank item. You. All righty. Item 13, the 2020 general manager's goals discussion. All right. I believe I don't have to, I have to pull up an email. I know, Colleen, would you like to start that based on the email that you had provided? Do you want me to call up uh, the 2020 goals so we can just review what was last year or the new sure. uh, quarterly check-in process? Both? Why don't we do both? Okay. Um, I'm just hoping that this will open or I might have to go back. Can you see that? Yeah. Yes. Cool? Okay. So in 2020, in, in 2020, and I can open the, ne the next um, presentation that Commissioner O'Rourke and, and Commissioner Hennessy did, they're both HR executives and we changed it from basically a point system uh, that we do once a year um, to more of a quarterly check-in that is supposed to be, um, you know, a healthier environment with, with um, you know, encouragement and, and any type of reprioritization um, discussion process. And we've also adopted that on the inside as well with our senior managers going forward. But these are a list of the goals that I reported on for 2020. And we did both the general manager and we did some board commissioner um, goals as well. Um, I won't re-report re on them, but I did put in Marlena's packet that I sent to her um, my submittal on this that I gave to the board. Uh, hold on, sorry. Let's um, share this. I'm not as good as Kathleen on <laughs> in, um, in making this quick. I'll see this. This is opening. Hold on. Geez, Kathleen, you're really good at this. So I, I won't go through this, but uh, I can uh, send this back out to Malena. This is uh, what Commissioner um, Talbot in, in Hennessy did on the quarterly check-ins um, and uh, how the new HR community um, you know, works with their employees to uh, for, for more of a positive outcome of uh, performance uh, of review. <clears throat> so this is the new procedure that we went to. Um, I made a suggestion for goals for, for this year that we're already in. We're, we're already in April. And um, we had last year the Wilmington substation, which we'll talk a little bit in, a, in executive session. Um, implementing all the NERC cyber and physical security. We just went through a big, um, a big change here in that uh, and, and lots of requirements that we have to implement. And so that's, 
that's very big on ensuring that the vulnerability was in the entire IT infrastructure, which includes not only our IT, IT business systems as, as you think of them, but our entire electric system because we do have a smart grid system that we're uh, implementing under Hamid's 20 year roadmap uh, that makes, you know, that reduces truck rolls, it tr reduces uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and it improves the efficiency of our response time. So there's lots of IT that goes across an entire utility system and we have lots to do. So I thought that was a, a, a very big priority. Um, the class uh, cost of service study and rate study is huge. We do that every three years. This has been very complicated this year because with all the changes to policy 30 on the new climate bill and all of those impacts. So we do the class to cost of service, you know, on a regular basis, but then when you when you factor in all those changes um, and then, you know, some new ideas that we're going to look at as well that would have to be blended in that for the, for the opt out uh, type of programs, uh, we're looking forward to presenting that in, in everything that will come through on that, the energy conservation charge, all of those things that come out of the climate bill all have to be factored in now within each of the rates. And that would be residential, commercial, municipal, and large industrial. Um, then of course you have time of use and um, you have, uh, well, all the rates are on the site. You can take a look at them, but um, achieving the APP RP3 award, um, you know, I can take, take credit for the fact that we're already in it, but I guess what I'm trying to say is we want to go to the next step. We want to go to to Diamond. We have, you know, we got 90% uh, score, which is fantastic, but I think we're, we're almost there. I think we're heading in the right direction. Our process improvements, everything is getting better as we laid out with our reorganizational study and all the changes that we've made. Um, back five or six years ago and where we are on that, I think if we keep going, that's a huge um, accomplishment uh, to continue that. You know, there's a lot changing out there with workforce management, you know, um, there's new laws, you know, we have vacancies here. The whole change process of succession planning going forward, you know, there's lots of people, they take jobs and it's like, well, you know, maybe I'll give you five years. You know, that's a, quite different from the electric utility industry where people, maybe like me would stick around for 30 years. You know, it, it, there's changeover. There's a lot more that goes into the entire process of making sure that we have quality skill sets working here. These are very unique positions. They're not just electrical engineers. They come in, they go through another seven years of career development to learn distribution and transmission engineering. Okay, same for power supply, very unique very unique skill sets. So we want to be able to go forward with that. The renewable choice program, we talked about that earlier with Marlene's input, Marlene's input and, and Greg's presentation. Um, I'd like to be able to get that done. If that dovetails into one of my suggested um, board uh, goals, would, which would be, let's look at that mission statement. Um, I actually told, um, Grace earlier in the CAB meeting that the reason why the policy 30 says that it's for the lowest price is not to say that it, it, it's not a, a controversial to people wanting to spend more. It's in that policy because you all told me, make this happen, this new climate bill, and don't make the price go up. That's what you gave me as a goal. This is why we go out of our way and power supply to find unit contracts and things that have lower risk management and the price fits into our portfolio. That might not be something that I can do as good of a job going forward with the new climate bill, but we're still working to that. So I actually uh, mentioned that in the cab, that that is why it's in there. But if we change a little bit of the mission statement, that will factor in as well. And then you know, my favorite is the three union contract negotiations start this year. That's every three years. So we have three unions and that's all going to start probably at the end of August and September. And um, and we actually enjoy it. I mean, there's a, there's a lot that goes on. There's a lot that's got to go back and forth, but that's when they start uh, more towards the end of the year. So uh, that goal would be more that that gets kicked off and, and we make some headway before before the end. So that's what I'm suggesting. Wasn't sure what you guys had in mind. For the, for the board goals, I was looking at um, 
changing the mission statement, as I mentioned, because that is our RMLD operational compass that we have right now. Uh, work to provide myself, staff, proper time for quality generation of analysis and presentation. And what I mean by that is we worked really hard to give the presentation on all this change on Policy 30 over the last few months. But even you listen to Hamid and Wendy, we have a huge business that we run and the electric system is huge. And I know focusing on power supply is very important, but we do have one of the largest electric municipal systems in the state. So what I want to do is just try to slow it down just a little bit. And, you know, when, when the public's asking for analysis or the board is act, asking for analysis, I know we've been going really fast. I want to make sure that quality is not compromised and to just give us a little bit of time and maybe, hey, can we make the presentation next month at the next board meeting? Because we do have skill sets that work here and we are able to offset hiring a lot of consultants to do our work for us. But if we hired a consultant, we might give them three, four, six months to do something, which we just magically make appear in a month, but it really does put a lot of pressure on staff. So I'm just ask, asking for a little compassion there. And then um, for the board to help maintain a healthy environment on these, on collaborative solutions, because we wanna be successful. But you do have to remember, aside from having accounting here, thank you, Wendy, we are an engineering based company that works on think tanks. We think, and myself, we wanna take Marlene's idea and John's idea and Phil's idea, and we wanna make it a better idea. That's how engineers think. And so we just wanna have that type of environment and allow every, all of our board to really understand the, these are engineers. We're all, most of us are engineers here, except for Wendy. But so that's, that's what I'm suggesting. Uh, thank you for allowing me to present. Wendy, I believe that is the ultimate compliment you could ever get from this group. So that's the way I would take it. So. I, I, Thank you. I, Bob, I'm actually, we go back and forth and she says, this is how accountants think. And I say, this is yeah, how exactly. engineers think. And we do that all day. Exactly. Good. Good. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, please, John. Um, I, well, first, I'd like to say, Colleen, I think that's a, that's a great list of things to be focused on. And of course, we review this on a quarterly basis. So there's always room for change, additions, et cetera. Um, I'd like to add one more to the board's responsibility, the board of commissioners. And that's to basically uh, walk through policy number 19 as a board and make sure that we're meeting the requirements of policy number 19. Uh, because uh, we've gotten sort of caught up, we've gotten feedback from the public that we're not doing certain things correctly, mostly because we've been so wrapped around the axle of payment to the town of Reading for two years or whatever, uh, that's consumed so much of our time and effort. So I'd like to go back or suggest to the board that we go back and look over with a fine tooth comb policy number 19 and make sure that we're following what has been prescribed in it or since it was written in the prehistoric era, that we make some changes to it that reflect the modern era. No, no disrespect, Phil. <laughs> it's just it's some of the things you've got to change some things when when things could move on. That's all. So just my input in terms of what I think the board ought to be doing. Mr. Chair, thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, yeah, I agree with uh, what John just said. Uh, I think that's a great idea. Uh, having been one who harped on a couple things in there. I, I can't disagree with what he just said. And also, what, I also agree with Colleen's sort of larger point about give us some time. And I'm looking at, you know, it's quarter of 10 and we're looking at these goals for the kind of the first time and maybe, maybe, you know, okay, this is great for now, but can we have some more time and space to think about what, what the goal list might be rather than saying, okay, this is it for the year or maybe it's just it for the quarter. But in that same spirit, give us as a board a chance to, you know, kind of think about this list, think about what we might want to add, whether it's what John said or other things. Um, you know, I might think about things that are more quantitative based about how can we reduce expenses or how can we measure the reduction of the peak, the annual peak, things like that that are doable to incentivize those things that are that are good for the system good for the economics, good for the environment. You know, how do we cut the peak? How do we increase adoption of um, time of use and things like that? I just don't have well well baked ideas to offer right now. Just 
the request is for, for time, Mr. Chair, to maybe, maybe we need a committee, maybe we need to just do this at a separate meeting and, and think about it. I, 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 think, I think you nailed it. I think we set these for the quarter and yeah. revisit it. That's probably the best thing. One of the things I was gonna suggest, um, I mean, we just did a customer survey I, I don't know if Reading Light's ever done an employee survey. You know, sometimes you, you, you do something like that. It, it, it might be something to think about, not tonight, but maybe in the next quarter or um, or at, at some point develop a structure or just, you know, put that into the into the mill as a, as a thought process. Um, a good idea. How about, um, how about we suggest a motion to accept these for a quarter? If that if that's possible, Phil. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, um, Colleen. These were just suggestions for a discussion tonight. There, this was not, oh, okay, there's good. no Perfect. motion for a vote or anything. So, no, I, I would never ask the board to give me more time for presentations and then ask for a vote on this. So <laughs> this was just for discussion, just to put something out there. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. One quick. Yes, Phil. Yeah, yeah just, just one thing to kind of tack on to John's discussion about 19. I'm seeing that it's uh, what, quarter of 10 at night. Now I'm a night fighter, so this this is fine with me. I don't go to bed before two o'clock in the morning. But, um, you know, we need to set a policy in 19 when, how we're gonna deal with these, with these goals. I think that's something we need to add as part of the 19 to look into that, how we set these goals and when we discuss them. Yeah. In terms of that, yeah. So we got more time than just 15, 20 minutes to discuss sure. these. I think we need more time than just, we need more time than just 10 minutes. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, All right. Any more discussion? No, that, that's, that made a lot of sense. Maybe we just need a special meeting or a committee meeting or something. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Um, we went over number 14 already. Yeah. All right, so now to item 15, um, uh, accounts payable, payroll, and cab meeting coverage. Um, cab meeting coverage, Phil, you are up. You were, yeah, you did the last one, but you're up again. I'll do another one. You know, oh. actually going with uh, in the Zoom meetings, I've been attending them all. It's so much easier now to do it this way through Zoom. Mm -hmm. You know, I recommend, you know, you get a preview of what's coming up the, the after the, you know, later on. Right. In many cases. Right. So you can have better questions. What can I say? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so accounts payable. Um, I'll, Wendy, I'll do. Okay. For May. okay. All right. You're going to do for May, Bob? I'll do it for May. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll save you, Marlena, for the first month. But that way get, it'll get you. It'll, you'll get your feet wet a little bit and then um, we'll, you'll at least get an understanding how they how they do it. Great. So I'll get... yeah. And then the next one would be June, June payroll. Dave was on for June payroll. I don't know if you want to look that out of it. Okay. You know what? Sorry, who, who's in the rotation for that or are we replacing Dave Hennessy? We're replacing Dave Hennessy. Oh, uh, I, I'm happy to do that. Okay. And then he doesn't come up again until um, for the board coverage in September. Uh, okay. okay. All right. And then the next meeting is Thursday, May 27th, if everyone can make that. Yep. No problem. Yep. Yep. All right. Yeah. Just uh, Marlene, if, if you have questions on the uh, warrant in the past, I've always kind of sat down with everybody and kind of gone over it with them. So. Uh, if you, you know, need any help or anything like that, I've always kind of gone with that and kind of in the past, some of the new members given them kind of feel the first time they sign. So you, I'm willing to help you out on that if, if you want it. Okay. I'd appreciate that a lot, Phil. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Can, can you repeat the next meeting? I'm not going to be here on the 27th. I think we have a couple of managers that are out. That's Memorial Day weekend. So I'm not, uh, that week so um we can put the goals off till june if you want but uh sure i uh, i just want to make sure you, that we uh, it'll definitely make the presentation shorter 
you'll just have Hamid. No, I'm kidding. Do, do, do I'm you want to? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> so, so do we want to move it to the twentieth, or do you want to keep it the twenty seventh? Minus Colleen. Wendy's not going to be here. Well, Wendy either. Um, why don't we the date? Um, how's the either or the third? How's that work? Uh, or Wednesday the twenty sixth. Uh, well, I think you're out the whole week, right, Colleen and Wendy? Uh, just oh, she's Wednesday. Out the whole week. Sorry. Just Wednesday and Thursday. Wednesday, Thursday. So. So we could do June. June third is fine with me. Um. Yeah, June third is fine with me. Can I ask Marlena? Sure, it's Wendy, fine. go ahead. So you want to push? So just so you know, we're we're planning the audit presentation. So you want to push the audit presentation to June? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just want to be clear. Thank you. So, um, Wendy, you'll have to coordinate with the town because it's the town audit committee has got to meet too. Yes, I will work with Kathleen and uh, Colleen to get all those contacts. Thank you. Um, I I think we also have a uh, audit subcommittee of the, of the commission. So I know I've always been kind of been on that, but I, I think some, I, need, I, I need a second person on that. We got a volunteer <laughs> of anybody? Any other commissioners? Um, that might be a good one for Marlena if she's interested in it um, mm. to really get kind of a handle in terms of the audit, which is, I, I find very interesting. If not, I'm happy to, to, uh, to play a role. Yeah. What other subcommittees are there? Not very many. One. This is the only one. <laughs> That's the only one, I think. I... Uh, Marlene, we, we had a lot of subcommittees, but we eliminated many of them because it was felt that the board should, all the board should be involved in many of the decisions. Mm -hmm. Good. John, it's all yours. Okay. It's all mine, you so, say? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, Phil, just let me know when. Yeah, they'll, Wendy, Wendy will be in charge. Wendy will say okay. it all. Great. Okay. Okay. All right. So then we'll move on to item 16, the move to executive Mr. session. Item, Mr. Still? Chair, um, I came across that the uh, Boston Business Journal is going to have on uh, May the 20th, they're going to have a uh, presentation on electrification. And one of the speakers is going to be the technical director of automotive business units of analog devices. It's at noon time, from noon to, to one o'clock. And you, I believe you got to sign up through the Boston G Business Journal. So I've, I've signed up to, to, I believe it's a Zoom meeting, but I, it is an analogical, and I thought the fellow from analog uh, devices kind of caught my eye since that is in our district. So, yeah. okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Phil, can, can may yeah. I speak, Chair? Um, yes, Phil, can you send us that link and take a picture of it with your phone yeah, or send it over? To, I'll yeah. send it. I'll email it over to you, Colleen. Later uh, on. Thank you so much, and I'll okay. distribute it in here. Thanks. Okay. Very good. All right. Okay. So again, move to uh, Phil, if you could. Uh, yeah. Very good. Item sixteen. Move that the Board of Commissioners go into executive session pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter One Sixty Four. Section 47D, exemption from public records and open meeting requirements in certain instances to discuss competitively sensitive issues regarding options for power supply and to consider the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real estate and to return to regular session for the sole purpose of adjournment. Second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, Cole, roll call. Cole, 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 yeah. Mr. Step back on it. Mr. Pacino, I. Marlene Vita, I. Ms. Coulteray. All right. Okay. See you in a few minutes. Uh, see you in a few minutes. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.